Hi, my name is Sig Lundgren, and I'd like to welcome you to Basic Pendulum Dowsing. Uh, for this particular uh, DVD, you need to have a pendulum in your hand. A pendulum is any balanced weight on the end of a bit of th thread or string or chain. This is one, for example, that I carry with me most of the time, all of the time actually. Here's another purpose-built one, a little bit smaller. It works quite well, but it doesn't have to be purpose-built or out of any particular material. This one, for example, is, uh, has a holy stone. It's a stone with holes in it. And it's the one, actually, that I'll be using for most of the program. But also, here's another one, which is a padlock on the end of a bit of string. Once again, it works perfectly well as a pendulum. Uh, a wedding ring on a bit of thread will also work very well. So, if you don't have one of these in your hand right now, please stop the DVD and go and get one, and we'll just see you in just a minute. Uh, welcome back. I trust uh, you now hold a pendulum in your hand, but before we go any further, what is dowsing? Dowsing is what I call intuition on demand. It's a way of getting information that is not available through the rational mind. I'd like to ask a question. What is 7 plus 5? Where you went for that answer is the place that has been trained for at least 15 years, I suspect, in school, your left rational analytical brain. On the other hand, if you want to know, is this man telling me the truth? Or, my wife just lost her wedding ring out on the lawn, where is it? You need to go somewhere else. And dowsing is the tool that can connect you to that somewhere else. To your unconscious, to your superconscious, to wherever one goes for the answers, there is no definitive uh, decision on where exactly that is. There are uh, four basic tools uh, that one can use for dowsing and a fifth special one. We've started with the pendulum here, which you've already seen. But in addition to the pendulum, there's one called a Y-rod, which is a forked stick, if you will. I happen to use a plastic one. And when you get over the target, it goes down. There are L-rods, which are L-shaped wires. You can actually even use coat hangers. And when you get over the target, they go out or they go in, depending upon what you want them to do. There's what's called a wand or a bobber, and this is a, a switch that I just cut, and it goes up and down or side to side. Up and down means yes, side to side means no. And then there's a tool called an orometer, which is like an L rod that's spring loaded that wants to pull the pointer out towards the center, but when you reach the target, it goes to the side, and you can follow the target that way. Um, each of these tools have their own special skills that you need to work with, but we're going to concentrate on this particular program with a pendulum. Uh, just as with the pendulum, it doesn't make any difference what it's made out of. From my perspective, I don't feel it makes any difference what any of these tools are made out of. Now, some dowsers say, in Vermont, where I come from, only applewood will make a good Y-rod. But I believe you can use anything for a Y-rod or anything for L-rods, make them out of coat hangers, or you can get a very special, expensive bobber. Uh, if you feel it makes a difference, what your tool is made out of, it does. If you don't, it doesn't. So, with your pendulum in your hand, let's begin by learning the three basic uh, responses a pendulum can give. Uh, there is no correct actions for these pendulums for yes, no, and the search position, or the three positions we're going to work with. But I'll show you the ones that I use, and most dowsers do use these. 
the search position just means it's where every dowsing operation begins. It's how the pendulum is when you begin your dowsing process. For me, it's back and forth. And that just means I'm up and running and I'm ready to get a response. So this is the search position and I'm holding it between my knees. Each of our uh, joints, in addition to the seven chakras we have going up and down our, our spine, we have chakras in our elbows and hands and in our knees and other places. And the right knee is usually positively yang charged, whereas the left knee is usually negative or yin charged. So we'll use those to help enhance what's going on here. Uh, for me, the yes response is a clockwise response. For me, no is an anti-clockwise or counterclockwise response. So here we are in the search position, which I actually make it go with my hand. You'll see my hand moving. And I'm in the search position, and I'm holding it with my hand pointing downwards. As you can see, I, I have it here, my thumb and first uh, finger pointing downwards. And whichever hand you're holding it in right now is the correct hand for you to be using. And you hold it over your right knee, and you notice how it goes into the clockwise direction. This is yes, this is plus, this is active, this is yang, this is yes. I go back in between, and notice how my hand pushed it back into the search position. And now we go over the left knee. And it goes from the search position to no. This is yin, this is no. This is receptive. This is lunar rather than solar. This is no and then back into the, in into the search position. Now, you want to be doing this exercise a number of times, going from search position to yes, plus, active, yang, search position, no, yin, receptive, no. Now, if it hasn't worked for you, it's time to what I call cheat. And basically, you're training this dog on a leash how you want it to respond. And so if you're in the search position and you go over here and it just sits there like that, make it go clockwise. Show it how you want it to be. This is yes, this is plus, search position. This is no, notice my hand, making it do it. And you do that for a couple of times and then try it again the next time without making your hand move, show me yes, show me plus. And the idea is to have it feel like it's working without any uh, part on, on your part making it move consciously. That's the trick. This is yes, no, and the search position. Once you have these three, you can play 20 questions. Remember maybe when you were a kid, is it bigger than a bread box or is it in the living room? And you can then ask yes and no questions to find the answers to whatever it is that you're looking for. Let's try these exercises. Please, you do them. Hold your pendulum that came with the kit in your hand, just as I am. Hold it between your legs. And this is the search position. Notice that I made it move. Then I go over to my right knee, and it goes in a clockwise direction. This is yes, this is plus, this is active, this is yang. Back between your knees into a search position and then over to the left knee. Notice it's going counterclockwise or anticlockwise. This is no, this is yin, this is lunar, this is receptive, this is no. You need to go back and forth and do this exercise 10 times today to program the dog on the leash, as it were, to really program your whole body and your unconscious as to what signals you want to mean what. Perhaps the thing that uh, differentiates a uh, practice dowser from a beginner is the ability for a good dowser to tune in on the exact thing that they're focusing on, to narrow the bandwidth. Um, and to do this, I use a series of questions when I douse. Uh, the more important the issue is, the more probably I am going to be using these questions. 
and uh, let me just share them with you. We'll go through them uh, probably one or two times. Uh, the first thing is I'm up and running, okay? And up and running is you sort of state the general area uh, that you wish to be questioning about. And I'm going to be asking about whether it's going to rain today, okay? This is the question that you can be using yourself later on for a practice session. And so you're in the search position and you say, okay, I want to ask about whether it's going to rain today. And you notice how it went into a yes? That just means I understand it isn't going to rain. It's not saying it's going to rain. It's just saying, yes, I understand the question and I'm ready to proceed. Okay. The next one is, can I? This is what I want to do. Is it going to rain? Can I? Which means, do I have the skills as a dowser to douse whether it's going to rain today? Can I? The next one, and you notice how it went into a yes. The next one is, may I? May I douse whether it's going to rain today? Well, now, this may not make any difference about the rain, but there are some times when permission is very important. And permission is a very ethically important thing for a dowser to get involved with. You don't go dowsing other people without their permission. It's a psychic invasion. It's like psychic rape, actually. So, may I means, do I have permission to do this? Now, wherever the answer comes from are uh, well, some people call them the chaps upstairs, uh, will give you also watch out for your well-being. And if you're going to get into something that might get you into trouble, for example, some dowsers work with uh, what are called sick houses. And these have sometimes ghosties and ghoulies and things that go bump in the night. And if you're going to get involved with those and you don't know how to handle them, when you ask, may I, you'll get a no. But in any event, so this is what I want to do, see whether it's going to rain today. Uh, can I? Yes. May I? Yes. And then, am I ready? Am I ready means, is it time for me to know this answer? For example, if you ask, is my mother going to, who's on her deathbed, is she going to die today? Maybe you're not ready to know that answer. It also means maybe I don't have the question phrased properly. But in this case, I do have my question, and my question, so I'm going to say, am I ready? And I get yes. And then you ask the question. And the question is, am I going to feel rain on my face sometime during daylight hours of today? Okay? And I'm going to douse for that right now. Am I going to feel rain on my face uh, right today? And the problem comes, oh, it, it's, it's not a cloud in the sky. There's not going to be any rain on me today. Aha! That's your left brain, analytical mind, getting in the way. And you mustn't allow that to impede the answer. And so after you've asked the question, am I going to feel uh, rain on my face today, during the daylight hours of today, you need to be like a child sitting in front of the Christmas tree, looking at those five different Christmas presents, uh, picking them up at, with his name on them, and picking them and saying, oh, I wonder what's going to be in here. Oh, this is a big one. I wonder what's going to be in here. And so if you can say, is, am I going to feel rain on my face sometimes during the daylight hours of today? I wonder what the answer is going to be. I wonder what the answer is going to be. I wonder what the answer is going to be. Well, as long as you're asking, you see I got a yes there. As long as you're asking, I wonder what the answer is going to be, you can't be saying, oh, there isn't a cloud in the sky. It can't possibly rain today. So you can't allow, you don't allow your, your, your left brain to get in the way of getting the proper answer. But is it the proper answer? Uh, well, the last question is, is this the truth? You genuinely want to know that. Now, first of all, I want to say you don't always get the correct answer in dowsing. Anyone who says they're 100% accurate with their dowsing is either uh, perfection incarnate, in which case you could fall on your knees before them and worship them, or they're damn liars, one or the other. Uh, so it isn't always correct, but the idea is to increase the possibility of getting the correct answer. And so by finally asking, is this the truth, you just double check it. So to run through again, this is what I want to do. Can I? May I? Am I ready? You ask the question. I wonder what the answer is going to be. I wonder what the answer is going to be. Is this the truth? So you go up through this chain of questions. And when you get to, is this the truth, if it is, if it gets a yes, and you want to ask more questions, you go back to asking the next question. You don't have to start with the first four again. And so the loop looks like this. You go up and ask the questions, and then ask the question again, ask the question again. And
And this is the way, the process that I use uh, to enhance the possibility of getting the correct answer. The next movement of the pendulum that I'd like to discuss after uh, learning yes and no and the search position, which I trust you'll be doing like 10 times a day for the next week or so to really imprint that into your consciousness and your unconscious. Uh, this next position is called the leading edge position or leading edge concept. And essentially it's when you want to be finding something. Where is? Like in this case I'm looking for this coffee cup which you can clearly see but that doesn't make any difference. Uh, it could be, where's my wife's wedding ring that's lost out on the lawn? And you start by swinging the pendulum in the search position to and forward, uh, to and fro in front of you. And what you'll see is that the pendulum begins moving over in that direction, back and forth, back and forth, until it's locked in that direction and it stays there. Now, the leading edge is the edge that's away from you. So watch, not where it is here, but out here, as it slowly moves over that way, until it's pointing there. So it's over there, it's not over here. It's not behind you. Or to the, to the left, it's to the right. That's the leading edge position and it's somewhere between my pendulum and over there. But if you're looking for something that's in a 40 acre field, it takes one more bit, which is called triangulation. I'd like to now use the leading edge with another concept called triangulation. To review here, if I'm looking for that coffee cup, which we can all plainly see, it goes back and forth, and then the leading edge moves over until it's somewhere over there. Okay, so I know that it's a line between me and over there. So I then move and come over to another place and ask the question, where's the coffee cup? And you can see the leading edge swinging back so that it's over there somewhere. It's where the two lines cross. That is where the target is. So I know that it's over there and I start walking towards it with my pendulum going in the back and forth position. That's triangulating where it is. But as I approach you'll see that it goes from back and forth into an ellipse. An ellipse, an ellipse, and when I get directly over it, it just goes round and round in a circle and if I go beyond it goes back into an ellipse and then just back into back and forth. So this, this, this idea of moving, going into an ellipse, into an over, that tells you when you're directly over the target. This would be, maybe you were looking for a place to drill for water, for a drinking well. It's right there. And it's at the crossing point of these true triangulation lines. Let's review the motion of the pendulum as it comes to a target. Here we are in the search position approaching the coffee cup and as we get closer you'll see it turns into an ellipse there and that ellipse rounds out until you get right over and it's really into a circle and then you go beyond and it's into an ellipse and then out into the search position. Another thing you can do with dowsing is called map dowsing. And most good dowsers, before they go out on a job, douse the site where they're going to save themselves some time. Uh, map dowsing, it's not exactly clear how it works, but it's uh, for the purpose of the search, the map becomes reality. For example, um, I. Well, here I am. For example, uh, I have this cross, okay, on my neck here, and uh, one could say, oh, well, that means he's a Christian, which may or may not be the case, but the point is, I really am very fond of Jesus, and I believe this means, this symbol is real, Jesus is with me. Uh, I have other symbols that I carry as well, but map dowsing works along those lines.
So for example, if I'm looking for underground veins of primary water that run through my house, what I would be to do would be to start going along the edge, uh, the northern edge in this case of my house, and you see I'm in the search position, and I'm in the search position, and I come to a place where it starts going around in a circle. That means I'm getting over the vein. I'm over it now. And then I go into the leading edge issue again, and where does it run? And it runs this way, and this way, and out here. So this one vein runs like that. Now, are there other veins in this house? And the answer is yes. Is this the truth? Yes, okay. Let's see. Uh, are there any more here? No. Okay, let's walk along this side. Okay, I'm looking for any veins of water coming through the house. There's one right here, okay? And where does it run, please? It runs this way, this way, and out there. Are there any other veins? Let's see, are there any other veins? Are there only two veins here? Are these the two veins? Is this the truth? Okay, so here are the two veins that run through my house, and you can see that you can use map dowsing to find them. We're standing in the living room, which is where the second vein that I drew on the map can be found. And this particular vein has an interesting connection because uh, here in Glastonbury, there were things called slipper chapels, where the pilgrims would come and wash their feet before they entered the sacred precincts of Glastonbury. And this particular vein, as I will show you, runs directly towards that slipper chapel, which is right next door. And there's a well there where they got the water from. But let's see how we find this vein first. I uh, want to ask about this vein. Can I? May I? Am I ready? Okay. Please show me the edge of the vein, okay, or the center of the vein, we'll say. And I'm in the search position, and I'm moving. It's going into an ellipse. It's going into a circle, okay? Now, I want to sh find out which way, now that my pendulum is directly over the vein, which, which way is downstream? Which way is it running? Watch the leading edge. It's moving over this way, like that, and when it's on the vein, it just goes back and forth. So I'll turn this way, because I'm on the vein, and I start walking, and as long as it's swinging directly back and forth, I'm over the vein. But if I get to one side, it points back towards the vein. So i got to get back on it, and it moves this way, and this way. Now you'll see it's beginning to curve a little this way, and it goes on out to the slipper chapel. Here we are back at the map, and I've been dowsing in my living room from here to here. And as you see, I walked across here and I said it went to the Slipper Chapel, which is my neighbor's house, which is just right next door, and it goes into their house here, uh, which is that place where pilgrims would wash their feet. Here's another use for the pendulum, or another response that it can make. And it would be, I'm not feeling very well, and I'm wondering if some lemon juice and, and vinegar and honey would be good for me to take right now. Well now, you might get a response that goes like this. And that means, yeah. But you also might get a response that looks like this. And what that means is, yeah! So depending upon the rapidity of the rotation, it goes, yeah, to, I'm making it do it, yeah!
This is my wife, Karen. We're standing in front of the Glastonbury tour. Up until now, we've shot all of this film at our home here in Glastonbury, but we're about to go up to Stanton Drew Stone Rings, a bit north of here. I use the term rings where you might have heard of these standing stone circles, but the vast majority of them in Britain are not true circles, so we'll call them stone rings. Before we go, though, there are three types of dowsing that you can do with your pendulum. One is to find the answers to yes and no questions. Two has to do to find specific physical targets, like that coffee cup that we were looking for. And the third has to do with intangible targets, like the human aura or the earth energies. And we'll be dowsing for both of those, actually, up in Stanton Drew. So why don't you come up there with us now? In order to look for these earth energies, the first place we want to begin is to find a vein of water outside of this stone ring that is not affected by the ring itself. And to do that, we're going to use this pendulum, which isn't the one that came with the kit, uh, with, the, with the CD, but we're going to have it go back and forth, and we're going to use that leading edge concept that we've looked at before. And I'm going to look, and you see it's watching this edge. It's going sideways now, and now it's actually going like it looked we began, but it's pointing that way. And so the place we need to look to for this vein, the closest vein from here, is back that way. This is a recap to show the movement of the leading edge of this pendulum. Notice the leading edge is aiming towards you right now, and I'm looking for that place where the nearest vein outside of the stone ring is, and you notice how it's swinging around, and it actually Looks like it's the way we began, but it's swung around, and now we're aiming behind me. We're standing outside of the stone ring. Uh, you can maybe see one of the stones in the background. I'm here with my wife, Karen, and what I want to do is to see what difference it makes when Karen is standing on some underground veins of water, which you might see crossing behind us here in white tape. But first I want to see her aura off the vein. And I'm going to go dowsing for her aura. And when I reach the edge of it, may I douse your aura? Okay. I want to douse your aura. May I? Can I? Am I ready? Okay. I want to find the edge of her health aura, which I find there. So when I reach out and touch her chest, it's about this far out. You got it? Karen is now standing on this crossing of underground veins of water. And I move towards her to look for her aura. And I move towards, and I move towards, and I move towards, and it's now this wide, her aura. It's contracted as a result of her standing over this yin source of energy, these underground veins of primary water. As you're probably aware, humans have chakras, seven major ones going up and down their spine. Uh, and I'd like to show them uh, using Kara's, Karen's chakras. May, may I douse your chakras? You may. This is an important issue. Please do not douse other people without asking their permission. And I start at her crown chakra, and you'll notice that it goes counterclockwise for me, which is yin. And then her brow is plus, her throat is minus. Her heart is plus, her solar plexus is minus, her sacrum is plus, and down at her root chakra, it's minus. So she has four yin and three yang. Men are just the opposite way around. My top chakra is plus and it goes plus, minus, plus, minus, and so on down. So each of us have a bit of the opposite in us. I have three yins and four yangs. Uh, so my energy is more balanced towards the male, whereas Karen's has four yins and three yangs, which is more balanced towards the female. 
So here we have a standing stone, and you notice from the white lines that are coming in at the corners, there are veins of water crossing underneath this stone. So there's a yin energy here, but there's also what's called an energy lay, which is right here and runs this way. And I go to the other side, they're six to eight feet wide. Here's the other side, and it runs this way as well. So there's a lay running like that through this standing stone. So this is on what I would call a power center. And the first thing I'd like to do is to show you on this power center that this stone has chakras or nodes. I start at the top and it's plus. Unlike Karen, it goes plus at the top. Men have a plus chakra up here. Women have a yin or a minus chakra. So plus, minus, plus. Notice this point. We're going to come to this throat chakra again. We go down a little farther and it's minus and right down at the surface it's plus. So there are five above and then there's two down below. So again it goes plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus. All standing stones are phallic and thus they seem to have the chakra pattern of plus, minus, plus, so on down, of males. And indeed the top of this stone, as we've seen before, is a plus. And we go down to the brow chakra, and it's minus. And then we get down to the throat area, and it's plus. And it is at this throat area that a very interesting thing happens if you lean against it. Karen, could you come please and uh, uh, lean against this stone? You want to put your hands directly over that nodal point there. Put your body as far back as you can, toes together, drop your head down, relax, and you spin off. At the end of this program, we're going to have uh, uh, another shot of this standing stone. This throat area will be marked. If you have a digital projector and can project that image against a, a white wall, and lean against it just as Karen was doing, because you are doing map dowsing, you can spin off. You can be in Peoria, Illinois, and you're transported here to Stanton Drew, and you can feel the effects of this spin-off process from the third chakra. Now, one bit of warning. If you do lean against the stone on the wall, and it isn't working, don't stay there too long, because it means something's blocked, and you can get a bad headache. But give it a try. It's a way of experiencing the energies of Stanton Drew when you're not even here. We're going to go from here up to the small stone ring right behind me. It's the second ring at Stanton Drew. And we'll be taking a look at Karen's aura up there and doing some more work to see how you can use dowsing in sacred space. While dowsing for the earth energies is certainly a useful thing to be doing with a pendulum in a sacred space, if what you're going to sacred space for is to tune into the sacred, I think the most useful thing you can do is use your leading edge theory to find the best place for you to stand to put yourself within a sacred space. Not everybody's spot is the same. I've asked Karen to be dowsing for this. You can see that she's now using the leading edge and walking in that direction for the best place for her to be standing within this sacred place. Notice it's just going back and forth. But now it's going in a circle and she's standing in that spot. When we looked at auric expansion before, we found that when Karen was standing over an underground vein crossing of underground veins of water, her aura was diminished to about here. But normally, when she was just standing in a neutral zone, her aura was about here. Sacred space does the opposite effect. It expands the aura as if um, an indication of the expansion of consciousness. And since she has chosen this space as the best place within this stone ring to stand, her auric expansion should be quite phenomenal. Let's take a look. I'm going to look for the edge of her aura now, that same health aura that I was looking for before.
this is really an indication of how useful it is to be standing in a sacred space when you're dowsing, when you're looking for sacred uh, connections, because it will help you connect more easily. I'm going along, I'm out now at the edge of the stone ring, but her aura is expanded, that health aura, way beyond there. I'm continuing on outwards, outwards, and it's as if her consciousness is expanded out to here. I'm coming to the edge now, I'm coming to the edge, and look for the edge of her aura now. It's here. And so the idea is if, for example, there are 12 steps to nirvana, why start at the first grade? Why not come to a place like this that automatically expands your aura and start on the third step? It gives you a head start, if you will. Sacred space gives you a jump on moving into the spiritual realms. So to review the work we've been doing together, we had three different kinds of pendulum usage, if you will. The first one had to do with the search position and yes and no. Uh, that you can use 20 questions to find the answers to anything that you're looking for. The second kind has to do with physical targets or tangible targets. Uh, where's my wife's wedding, wedding ring that she lost out on the lawn? Or today we looked at where is a crossing of two veins of primary water? Now, we didn't actually see those veins, but if you drill down, you theoretically should have hit water at that crossing point. The third type of dowsing that we've been doing today mostly is intangible targets. When we've been looking at the aura and the contraction of the aura and the expansion of the aura or looking at how you can lean against a stone and be spun off or uh, finding the best place within a sacred space to be standing to do whatever it is you want to do, meditate or say a prayer or do other things that can help you grow spiritually. There are two other types of dowsing responses that I didn't talk to you about earlier. One is if you find that you've asked a really dumb question or a stupid question or it won't get you the answer you're looking for, your, your pendulum will go in a 45 degree angle, at least for me it does that. And what that means is stupid question. Rephrase your question, ask a different question, you're not going to get the answer you're looking for asking that question. Uh, and finally, if you find that your responses begin to not make sense, it really should be no when you're getting a yes, for example, um, or you really think it should be no, uh, check your responses again. Hold it over your right knee, show me your yes. Over your left knee, show your no. Sometimes the responses change. They never have for me in the 40 years that I've been doing pendulum work. They've never changed for me, but some people they do. So please check that again. So in closing, I'm reminded of the story of the fellow in New York who asked a New Yorker, uh, what's the quickest way to Carnegie Hall? And the New Yorker looked him right in the eye and said, practice, practice, practice. Now that's my advice to you in terms of pendulum work. Good luck. Blessings on you. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me at my website, Mid-Atlantic Geomancy. The URL is given plus other information, for example, of dowsing societies both in the United Kingdom and in the United States. The American Society of Dowsers has a wonderful motto in Dago Felix, to the fruitful search. I wish that for you. Goodbye now. So if you have a digital projector and can project this image against the wall, you will notice that we've marked that third chakra down. Please now is a chance for you to go up and lean against the wall and do some map dowsing of this stone here in Stanton Drew. Please remember don't stay in that position with your toes touching and your head bowing down for too long and also have someone there to catch you in case you spin off quickly.